Hi AP Statistics students, this is Ms. Skoken. Welcome back to Chapter 1. We're going to be continuing our study of data and statistics by looking at categorical data. In this chapter altogether, we'll be looking at categorical and quantitative, otherwise known as numeric data. We'll be interested in organizing it so that we can analyze it, and then uh, so that it tells its story in the best possible light and most accurately we're going to learn how to display and describe data. At the end of this section you should be able to construct and interpret par bar graphs and pie charts otherwise known as circle graphs. Understand when we're looking at at graphs that are deceptive so be co good consumers of graphs. Construct and interpret two-way tables describe relationships between two categorical variables and then be able to organize, interpret a real world problem and organize the data into structures that we will use for further analysis. Now we know that categorical variables place individuals into different groups or categories. For example, if we're categorizing M&Ms, one variable that we may, a categorical variable that we may use is color the different values that the variable color can take on may be red, yellow, orange, blue, brown, for example, and the counts or the percents of the frequency of each one of those colors is going to give us the distribution of the categorical variables. So we have an example on page 8 in our textbook and it's an example about the radio audience rating service Arbitron and it places 13,838 radio stations into categories to describe the kind of programming that they broadcast. We have two different tables. The first one is frequency, so it's just counts, the counts of stations for each of these different categories and then we have the percents which make up a relative frequency table. Now, the variable is format, okay, format of radio station. The values that it can take on are adult contemporary, adult standards, contemporary hit, etc. The counts are the numbers, the actual numbers, like 1,556, or in the case in the example with the little arrow, news and talk are 2,179. The percent is calculated as that number, that count, 2,179 over the total, 13,838 and expressed as a percent. Okay, when we look at these tables, it can be a little bit overwhelming, it's a lot of information, so what we try to do is we let the picture paint a thousand words and we either organize them into a bar graph or a circle graph. And a bar graph just, it can either do the counts or it can do the percentages, either way. What we have on our horizontal axis is the different values that the variable uh, um, format take on and then in the vertical direction we have the count. Now that could be reversed especially if we're doing a comparison bar graph. The percent is great to show in a circle graph because bar graphs specialize in comparing parts to parts and circle graphs specialize in comparing parts to a whole. That's why we love that idea of getting the percent, seeing the whole and then seeing which ones are the heavy hitters such as very clear the highest percentages in this circle graph are for the news talk radio stations and the country radio stations. You can see that we have a Dilbert cartoon so go ahead and pause the video so that you can read and appreciate the cartoon. Alright, so graphs can be accurate and effectively communicate ideas or they can be deceptive. They can be deceptive because of intentional practices by the creator of the graph or through misuse of scaling. And here you have a slide that says bar graphs compare several quantities by comparing the heights of bars that represent those quantities, but if they're in a pictograph, for example, or, and they use areas differently, uh, to describe scale, then we might be misled by the area rather than by the height or the length of the pictograph or the bars. See, avoid the temptation to replace the bars with pictures for greater appeal. It can be misleading. Also, there is a way to do it accurately. So if you decide to use a pictograph for some reason, make sure it represents counts and not 
show not deceive the eye and cover area instead of height or weight. This is to give you an example. This ad for DirecTV has multiple problems. How many can you point out? And pause the video now so that you can see some of the different issues. There are at least two problems and there may be more in this graph. So pause the video and take a look. Hopefully you detected that both the scale where the graph begins, this one, the yellow one for cable starts at 56. It only shows 56, so 44% of the graph is not shown, the bottom half of the scale. In addition to that, it's not only uh, showing the scale in height, it's also showing an area, and that definitely makes it deceptive. Okay, so we're going to take a look at two-way tables, also known as contingency tables. The reason that they're called two-way tables is that we have two categorical variables, one in the rows, the other one in the columns. And let's take a look at the example on page 12 in your textbook. And it reads, a survey of 4,826 randomly selected young adults aged 19 to 25 asked, what do you think are the chances you will have much more than a middle class income by age 30? We see the responses that are in the table. And you can see the two different variables that are listed. One of them is the gender, male, female. The other variable, at which the values can be male or female. And the other one is the variable opinion. And we see five different possible opinions, almost no chance, some chance, etc. Those are different opinions. Now we can see the total down at the bottom. I'm, I apologize, it's slightly cut off on the screen, but basically you have 4,826 that were split into male and female. Okay, sometimes when we have two-way tables with data, we wanna be able to just look at a mar marginal distribution. That lets us look at one of the categorical variables in either counts or percents. And to examine a marginal distribution, we're going to calculate just either the row totals or the column totals. We can graph the marginal distributions in a circle graph because they're going to total up to 100%. So here's our table again from the example on page 12. And the marginal distribution of chance of getting rich that we're going to look at is going to summarize each of the different rows. So we're gonna be looking at the row totals only. As you can see, we're gonna calculate each one of the row totals we're going to divide that number by the grand total for all the rows and that's going to give us the marginal distribution of chance of getting rich. So we have those opinions, each of the percents of those opinions are going to total 100. We could graph that either in a bar graph to compare parts to parts or we could graph it in a circle graph comparing parts to whole. Now, the marginal distribution really gives us a summary of one of the variables or the other variable, but it's not going to give us any information about the relationship between the two variables in the two-way table. So for that, we're going to use a conditional distribution. And a conditional distribution of a variable describes the values of that variable among individuals who have a specific value of another variable. So although it's not the clearest definition, it, it will be when you see the example. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of the variables. We're gonna use that variable's total as our denominator rather than the grand total as our denominator. And then we're gonna look at the, the way that the other variable spreads out over that variable that we've chosen to use the total for. So. Let's take a look, and again, we have our same example. We're gonna calculate the conditional distribution of opinion among males. So what this means is we're only gonna be looking at males, and we're gonna look at the distribution of opinion amongst the males. So the total that we're using as our denominator is gonna be the 2459, not the 4826 that we used a few minutes ago for the marginal distribution. This gives us the conditional distribution of opinion for all the males, but only the males. When we graph it, we can see we're looking at just males and it gives us the spread in percent. We, this also, remember, our bar graph could also be in counts if we wanted it to. But the only way that we can compare to the females because they have different totals is if we use percents. Then we're comparing apples to apples. Now you see that comparison being done. So we, what we did with the males, then we did with the females. We divided by the column total for female, so our, our denominator for the female 
percents is 2367. Once we calculate each of the percents, we can do a side-by-side -side bar graph that allow allows us to do a comparison of opinions between males and females. And you can see the males are a little bit more optimistic than the females are regarding where they think they're going to be by age 30. Okay, this graph is super powerful because this is a combination of a bar graph and uh, the elements of a circle graph. It is called a segmented bar graph and this one allows us to compare both parts to parts and parts to whole in a single graph. So what we've done is we've stacked up the different opinions. We can still do a comparison of green to green or red to red between males and females, but we can also compare the parts within a bar so that we can compare the blue to the purple within a bar, for example, for males. So this is a great one. This is called a segmented bar graph. Definitely one you want to put in your hip pocket so that you can pull out and use. All right, when we organize a statistical problem throughout the year, more so in the second half of the year, we're going to use what we call the four-step process. State, what's the question that you're trying to answer? That's the first of our steps and probably the one where you, you might remember in algebra where you had to define variables. This is kind of analogous to that where you're trying to kind of contextualize exactly what you've got in the problem and what you're trying to find. Plan. How are you going to go about it? What procedures are, are you going to use? What graphs are you going to use? What calculations are you going to use? This is just your plan. What techniques are appropriate for this problem? The next thing is the do. That's where you're either creating the graphs or performing the calculations that you need to answer the question. And conclude is where you put it all together and you basically are able to justify with reasoning, with graphs, with numerical evidence from your do the answer to your question that, that allows you to summarize everything that has happened in the problem. Okay, so section 1.1, analyzing categorical data. We've learned that the distribution of a categorical variable lists the categories and gives the counts or percents of individuals that fall into each category. We've learned that pie charts and bar graphs are the go-to graphs for categorical data. We've learned that a two-way table organizes data about two different variables and that's why it's called a two-way table, one in the columns and one in the rows. And that the row totals and column totals in a two-way table are what give us the marginal distribution. When we calculate the percents for a marginal distribution, we're using the grand total for the table. We've also learned that there are two sets of conditional distributions for a two-way table depending on which one we choose to use as our denominator, either the rows or the column totals. We've used a side-by-side -side bar graph or a segmented bar graph to display conditional distributions. A side-by-side -side was the, the one that we had the males and females next to each other. The segmented one is the one that splits up all the responses in a single bar. To describe the association between the row and column variables, we compare an appropriate set of conditional distributions, meaning we need to compare apples to apples. So that's why we use those conditional distributions it gives us a different way of looking at the variable because it changes the denominator and we can compare apples to apples. Even a strong association between two categorical variables can be influenced by other variables lurking in the background. This is something we'll have to be more careful of as we move forward because there are always variables that can affect both of the variables that we're interested in at the moment. And that we're going to be using the four-step plan, state plan, do conclude. And in the next video, we're going to be talking about appropriate graphs for numerical or quantitative data. So we'll see you then.